Deuteronomy 12 and 13. And Elijah Dean, would you lead us in prayer, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we can come and worship you tonight and pray that you be with those that may not be here yet and help them to have a safe trip here. And please be with those that were not able to make it out tonight. Help them get through whatever illness or sickness they are dealing with. And thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross and save us from our sins. And please help more souls to be saved in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, Deuteronomy 12 and 13 is a, a portion of the book where Moses is preaching through really the first two of the Ten Commandments, uh, where he talks about, of course, back in chapter 5, have no other God before me and have no graven images. And as we go through this, I think we see him sort of expounding and making application on those things. But uh, let's read Deuteronomy 12 to begin with verses 1 through 4. Who will grab that for us? Deuteronomy 12, 1 through 4. Clint, did you raise your hand? Yeah, you're going to have to raise your hands just a little higher. So I'm a little lower. Yeah. These are the statutes and judgments which you shall be careful to observe in the land which the Lord God of your fathers has given you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispossess serve their gods on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. And you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, burn their wooden images with fire. You shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names from that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God with such things. Okay. So... This entire chapter really is directed at worship, the way that God directs and prescribes, and it opens up here with when they get into that land, they are to purge idolatry out of that land, get rid of it. And why is it that they would need to get rid of that? Why would he tell them to go in and wipe all those things out? Paul? No, so there wouldn't be any question about serving other gods. Okay, so there's no question that people on the outside would see that and know it. Chris? It's an abomination to God. It's an, it is an abomination to God. Yeah, that's part of why... That's part of why they're going in the land is to punish the people for their idolatry, for the iniquity of that land. And part of that's going to be to purge that out, to get rid of that. Any other thoughts on that? One of the things is... Those things shouldn't be around there to draw the children of Israel to them. Because if they're around them, they may start being curious about it, start you know, learning about it, being drawn to it. And they don't want that to happen. God doesn't want that to happen. They need to purge the evil influences from among them. In the New Testament, there is sort of a similar type of thing that happened. If you remember in Acts chapter 19... And we, we don't need to read this account here. But in Acts chapter 19, where it talks about these uh, miracles that are being done by Paul, one of those, remember, was a Jewish exorcist tried to cast out um, demons, and the demons leaped upon the man, or the demon-possessed man leaped upon the exorcist and beat them and, and sent them away. But it goes on to talk about when people saw that, they took their books and they burned them. And it's the idea of their idolatrous books, their unholy books, those types of things, that they got rid of them and, got, and purged them from among themselves, among the Christians. So here is the same type of idea. Get in there and get rid of those places because he talks about destroy the places where they are and, verse 3, destroy the altars and break the sacred pillars and the wooden images. So every piece of idolatry, whether it's the, the general area that they've set up, the actual altar, the image, get rid of all of it from the land. And he says, do not worship the true God as pagans worship their false gods. In verse 4, you shall not worship the Lord your God with such images. Any other thoughts there? 
All right, let's read 5 through 14. Who will grab that for us? Deut Deuteronomy 12, verses 5 through 14. Go ahead, Zach. But you shall seek the Lord at the place which the Lord your God will choose from all your tribes to establish his name there for his dwelling, and you shall come there. You shall bring there your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the contribution of your hands, your vowed offerings, your voluntary offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. There you and your household shall eat before the Lord your God, and rejoice in all your undertakings in which the Lord your God has blessed you. You shall not do at all what we are doing here today, everyone doing whatever is right in his own eyes. For you have not as yet come to the resting place and the inheritance which the Lord your God has given you. When you cross the Jordan and live in the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance, and he gives you rest from all your enemies around you so that you live in security, then it shall come about the place in which the Lord your God will choose for his name to dwell. There you shall bring everything that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the contribution of your hand, and all your choice of our offerings which you will vow to the Lord. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your sons and daughters, your male and female slaves, and the Levite who, who is within your gates, since he has no portion or inheritance with you. Be careful that you do not offer your burnt offerings in any cultic place that you see, but only in the place which the Lord chooses in one of your tribes. There you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do everything that I command you. Okay, so question number one I'd ask, where would God eventually tell Israel to worship, and what can we learn from this? Where's the big place of worship eventually that everything ends up centered there? Yeah, eventually the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, when Solomon built the temple, of course, David had uh, bought the threshing floor of Arana there before the Ark of God had been there for some time. David collected all the materials, but then the temple is built there. Solomon dedicates that temple. And then it talks about in Solomon's dedication prayer how the people should turn and pray toward that house, uh, no matter where they may be. So eventually it's in Jerusalem. Where was it before that? Did anybody get that? It's sort of temporary, but it was temporary for hundreds of years. The tabernacle. Yeah, out in the desert, they moved it from place to place. And Philip. Yes, in Shiloh, in Joshua chapter 18, they had set up the tabernacle in Shiloh after they had gone in, they had conquered the land and sort of started to semi-establish themselves there. Um, when you get into uh, the book of 1 Samuel, it's still in Shiloh. Remember, the book of 1 Samuel opens up with Elkanah and Hannah going down to, going to Shiloh to offer up the sacrifices. That's where that story unfolds with Hannah and then, of course, her giving birth to Samuel. And then it, it talks about later on how that, that tabernacle was in Shiloh. So there was Shiloh for a time. But the permanent dwelling place is really what he's referring to here in Deuteronomy. He's looking ultimately to Jerusalem being the place of worship for his people. Now, what can we learn from that? Anything? Any lesson to be drawn out? How about God is the one who directs worship, and when he told his people, this is where you're going to worship. That's where they were to worship. They weren't free to go and do it anywhere they wanted to. They weren't free to uh, observe the Feast of Tabernacles or to have the, the yearly atonement, um, wherever they wanted to offer that up. God told them, this is where it's going to be. That's where the ark would be. That's where the priest would go in into the Holy of Holies once a year. So God is the one who prescribes worship and gives it, and we have to go where God tells us to go and do things as God tells us to do them. We'll talk some more about that in just a bit, but any thoughts there? Well, God chooses where he will dwell, and we're to come to him. Yeah. And so it was not just a place of worship. It was where he would dwell among them, and that's still true today. Right. Exactly right. Exactly. 
Um, it's worth noting as you go down, Clint, go ahead. Right. There, there are fundamental principles that have a different application here in Deuteronomy 12 than what they would have in the New Testament, but the principles are the same. That God is the authority, God is the one who directs, and we are the ones who are to comply, to submit to that authority. And as you read this chapter, really the next chapter, as we've, we've briefly mentioned before, there is exclusivity in the religion of Jehovah, Zach. I was just going to say, it's a much lower point, but it's, it's an application that works. Think about in the workplace. You don't say, hey, boss, come to my office and let's have a chat based on this thing you asked me to do. No, you go to your employer's office once you know he's available to meet with you. You don't rush in. Now, we can approach God whenever in prayer. You know, we don't have to wait for the opportune time to, but in a secular sense, we, we recognize that respect of appealing in such a way that you will be received. Um, and so why wouldn't we have that same thought toward God? As one has mentioned in our application of worship, why wouldn't we come to God on his terms? We do that in the world for our, our employers, for example. Um, you have a very traditional view of employment. <laughs> no, it's, it's, that's true. It is changing in our culture, though. There, there is this spreading disrespect in every area of life, in, in schools, in the workplace, um, you know, with authorities like police officers. Like, why do I have to listen to you? You know, that kind of attitude. But you're right. People... There are still a good number of people who recognize, you know, this person's in authority over me, and I dance to their tune. They, they don't do what I decide to do here. So that, that is a point well taken. Um, when, you, when you read in here, you see this exclusivity. Paganism is ecumenical. Paganism was the idea, you can have your God and I can have my God. And you can worship where you want to worship and how you want to worship. And I'll worship where I want to worship and how I want to worship. And we're all good. Because it doesn't matter which God you serve, how you worship, where you worship. None of that mattered in paganism. Where am I going with this? Join the church of your choice. Join the church of your choice. You can believe how you want to believe. I'll believe how I want to believe. You worship the way you want to worship. I'll worship the way I want to worship. That, that has completely infected the religious um, community, if you will, the, re the religious thought of people in our nation. Just do it however you want to do it. And it's called ecumenism. It's called, you know, everybody's okay. We all accept each other. And, and that, I want us to understand, that's a pagan idea. Here... Moses is laying out, there is an exclusivity. Go in, first of all, get rid of all that idolatry, every semblance of it in the land. You're to purge the land of that. And then you are to go into worship where I tell you to worship. And that's it. So very much an exclusive type of thing. Um, let's think about this for a minute. In Acts 4, Acts chapter 4, Remember, Peter, John, the other apostles have been arrested. They're standing before the council. In Acts 4, verse 10, when he's been questioned, you know, what authority do you have to do these things? And he declares to them, 
well, it's in the name of Jesus Christ that I do these things. And Acts 4, verse 12, if somebody would read that for us, because Peter makes a key point here. Acts 4, 12. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Okay. Now, how would the Jews and the pagans of the time react to that declaration? There is salvation in no other. What, what's Peter claiming here in the thought that we're pursuing? Philip. Right? They are faulty in their beliefs. <laughs> yeah. Right. And he's, ex he's claiming exclusivity in Jesus Christ. There is no one else you can go to or turn to. You have to go through him for the salvation of your soul. That was offensive to the Jews. That was ridiculous to the pagans. But the, where, where do we stand today in our society on this question? Salvation is in Christ alone. Mike. It's offensive and it's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, you, there, there's, there's people you see, they have the coexist bumper stickers on their cars, you know, who they... They just think every religion is valid. That is, that's not even masked paganism or dressed up paganism. It is just paganism. But there are more and more people who say they believe in Jesus Christ, but they also believe other people are just as sincere in their religious beliefs. And if, you know, if they believe what they believe, especially Jews and Muslims, they would throw those to him because they say, well, they worship the same God we do, and they don't. But they say they worship the same God we do, so as long as they're sincere in their beliefs and they're decent, good, upstanding people, everything's okay with them. So this idea that salvation is only in Christ is breaking down even in our society today. Um, what about Galatians 1? Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9. Who will grab that for us? Galatians 1. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. 6 through 9. Yes, sir. And I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who thought you and want you to prevent the gospel of Christ. But even if we were an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you let him be accursed as we have said before so now i say again if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received let him be accursed okay so acts 4 one savior galatians 1 one gospel there are no other gospels, but what do people, how do people view this today? Clint. There's one gospel, there's one Bible, but there's many interpretations. Right. So we, we don't have to necessarily agree on everything. We can, we can have a variety and still be pleasing to God. Okay. The gospel is also called what? The... Okay, the truth, revelation. the revelation, or good news, the word. I'm looking for another one. The faith, right? The faith. But a lot of people say, well, what faith are you? Well, that, that is a wholly unbiblical question. There's only one faith in the Bible. But what they're saying is, how do you believe? How do you worship? What's your particular brand or flavor of Christianity? That's what they're asking in that. 
And Paul's saying here, there's one flavor, there's one brand, there's only one gospel. Anybody comes to you with a different one, they're to be accursed, condemned. Clint. Yeah, uh, do you remember the, the Ephesians? Great is Diana. Uh, but in Ephesians 4, 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. And that very offensive. Right. And that's that's the thing that I, I'm driving at here is, you know, Moses is warning the people, you're going into a land that's filled with paganism. And you have to deal with that. You've got to purge that out. You cannot be lured into that way of viewing the world and religion and worship. You, you just can't go down that path. We live in a world that's filled with paganism. It hasn't changed. The, the, the names have changed in some of the outward circumstances, but we need to understand people caught up in denominationalism are caught up in paganism. They, they just say it's like Jesus Christ. I mean, the, the ultimate example of it to me is Roman Catholicism, where literally when they would go into a land and find paganism, they would tell people things like, well, you can still worship your son, God, but now you need to call him Jesus. And then they would just absorb that into Roman Catholicism, right? But more and more denominations are absorbing the culture around them. And they, they're deceiving themselves into thinking, well, we're still worshiping Jesus. We just found a better way to worship Jesus, a more exciting way, a more appealing way. And that's what they're driving at is how to appeal to the culture. We shouldn't figure out how to appeal to the culture. We need to lay the gospel out there and let that be the thing that draws them instead of figuring out, well, what are they going to be happy about? What is it they like? What is it they want to hear? Zach, did you have, or Chris, sorry. The, uh, the one thing that's been going on for quite some time, and you see it even more a day, is in the denominational world, people are going out to look for a, quote, church in the denominational world that fits them, what, they, what fits their ears. If it offends them, they will pack up and leave on those tribes until they find rock show or somebody who's only given half the word or well or maybe they won't even talk about how they're truly living and they know it mm -hmm. uh, you know whoever's doing the preaching or how they're set up they won't even mention anything about it it's an unsaid thing let's, let's just don't talk about it and as long as they don't feel offended they will continue to go yeah and a lot of it is driven by what do they have for the young people and what they're talking about there is what kind of youth activities, what kind of distractions, what kind of games, you know, what kind of fun are they going to have that the kids are there and they really like it. That's, that drives a lot of people these days. Um, and so we want to understand that's the wrong approach, that's the wrong philosophy that is not grounded in the Word of God. We have to be seeking truth and devoted to that truth. Uh, understanding that the truth of Christ, the gospel of Christ, is an exclusive religion, and that is very offensive to the world around us. When you read through the, the book of Philippians, um, you look in Galatians or even in 1 Corinthians, other places, you see where there are believers that are condemned because of different reasons. So Philippians chapter 3, for instance, he calls them dogs, evil workers. They're of the mutilation. And he's talking about Christians who accepted circumcision as necessary for salvation and were pushing that doctrinal belief. They're called evil workers, called dogs. So even Christians fall under this. We, we deviate in doctrine, 
We deviate in worship, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where they perverted the Lord's Supper. They turned it into a common meal. Paul excoriates them over that. He says, you need to go eat at home. you got to get this straight. So doctrine, worship, morals, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, a man who had his father's wife, the whole church was perfectly fine with that evidently. He says, you've got to withdraw from him. So there's exclusivity in the religion of Christ, and some people have a hard time coming to grips with that. But just as Moses is telling the people here, you, you've got to purge that. It can't be a part of uh, your society, a part of your culture. You, you've got to get those things out of there, and you need to do exactly what God tells you to do. And the, the, those principles apply to us today, and we need to be committed to them. Any other thoughts there? Zach. There's some where it's you, this is a matter of life or death. You would do whatever to, to live. Well, that's what this is. It's a matter of life or death. But as many have said so far, many, and you, like you just mentioned, even Christians don't live as if it is. But it certainly is. It's a, it's a matter of spiritual life or death. And so if we look at it that terms, it, it makes it a little bit easier to remember, yeah, it's not about what I want to do. Even though what I want to do sounds fun, what people want to do could be great, but it's that it leads to death. So it's that concept that we would take seriously in most other applications. Why don't we take it seriously in spiritual? A lot of people do, other people don't. Sure, sure. And one of the big driving things is I want people to like me. I don't want people to get angry at me. I don't want people to get upset. I want to fit in with culture, with friends at work, at school, or wherever it may be. And again, that's, that's not what the Lord calls us to. He calls us to holiness. He calls us to sanctification. He calls us to separation from the world around us. And that means, you know, there are going to be people that are not happy about that, that disapprove of that. Well, that's okay. That's okay because we have an audience of one. We have one that we are to please and only one. Mike. Right. To, we, we are made to connect with and to be social creatures. And one of, one of the beauties of the New Testament, as it describes it to us here, we're a family. Children of God are a family. And that's where our connection is. And it's a, it's a great blessing when our blood family is also in our spiritual family, but we're not all blessed like that, as we're going to read about, you know, chapter 13. That that doesn't always work out. But we, we have that connection with us. We can draw encouragement and strength and help and find that connection among other people of like precious faith and value that connection that we have with one another. So very good. Glad you brought that up. Um, when, he, when he goes through this here, verses 5 to 14, back in Deuteronomy chapter 12, and he's talking about God's going to pick a, a, a place of worship. They were not free to choose a different place of worship. And they, they had to follow that prescription, if you will. Um, you know, when we travel to different places, we have to be mindful of where it is that we stop in worship. You know, not just any place is acceptable to God. You know, we can't just go in and say, well, there's people here worshiping and let's go worship there. Because it could very well involve us in having fellowship with people who are in rebellion to God and sin toward God. Um, so we, we need to be mindful of those things and worship God with a clear conscience and striving to do His will in all things. And it's interesting to me that he says, you know, it's not going to be like it was before the wilderness wandering. There's going to be some, uh, you know, a fixed place of worship now when you get into that land. And it just shows me that there is a change 
in the way things are done, a change of authority. And from the Old Testament to the New Testament, there's a change of authority as well. All right, any other thoughts there? So question number two, question number two in this, I tell you what, we need to jump forward a little bit. Um, I'll just go ahead and get it. Question two, what could they eat and not eat depending on the location and why? Who's got that? We'll skip the reading. I trust you read that, but what could they eat? Where could they eat? What were the differences? Right. So God had laid out in the law, here's various sacrifices that you need to bring to me. They, they had to do the tithing, things like that. That was all to be taken to this place of worship and done there. The other things, he said, look, you're hungry. You want to eat something. That's perfectly fine. You want to eat a goat. You want to eat oxen. You know, that's good. You, you go out and, and you take a deer or a gazelle. You can eat that. Perfectly fine. So you have freedom in those things, but when it comes to these offerings that God has laid out, there's very particular rules attached to that, and you need to respect that and follow that. Any applications, lessons, thoughts on that? What about the Lord's Supper? Let me ask you this. Um... When it comes to just the practical, physical, material side of things, if they ate a lamb at home or they ate a lamb at the tabernacle, what's the difference on the physical, material side of things? The location. Okay, maybe the location. It's just eating lamb. What's the difference, though? One is to the Lord, one is for physical food. The purpose. The purpose of it, right? When there's a difference in a purpose of a common meal and the Lord's Supper. Has anybody ever eaten unleavened bread and drank grape juice at home? Anybody ever done that? I'm not saying that you that you go and you're like, okay, I'm going to say a prayer for the body of the Lord. I'm going to say a prayer for... That's not what I'm talking I'm just asking, have you ever eaten unleavened bread and had a glass of grape juice in your home? I have. Hey, okay. What's the difference? It's the purpose. It's not in the elements. Yeah, there's some difference in the location, right? But the difference is the purpose, the point of it. And that's really what... Paul's driving at in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says, we're, we're not coming together for a common meal. That, that's not the reason we're here. And so you shouldn't make it a common meal. We're here to remember the sacrifice of the Lord and to declare we believe in Him and look forward to His return. So there's a difference in those things. And that's what Moses is laying out for them here. Look, you can eat what you want, but when it comes to the sacrifices, there's a very specific rules attached to those things. Any other thoughts there? All right. Uh, jumping forward a little bit. Let's read 29 through 32. Otherwise, we're not going to get to chapter 13. So chapter 12, 29 to 32, who will read that? Philip. When the Lord your God cuts off from you, cuts off from before you the nations which you go to, Displace them in the land. Take heed to yourself that you are not ensnared to follow them after they are destroyed from before you. And that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? I also will do likewise. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abomination to the Lord, which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they, for they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to 
Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it nor take away from it. Okay, so question three I'd ask, what is the lesson of these verses? How is it applied today? So what's, what's the upshot of what he's telling him here? Don't change it. Don't change it? Don't change it. Okay, Mike, you have something to add? Well, I was just going to say, you know, they're going into a place that's been described as a, a land flowing with milk and honey. And you see all the blessings that these people have on the land. Do not think that just because they have these blessings around them and they are prospering, that that's okay to do what they do. And so when you drive them out, you're going to take over this land. Don't look back and go, I wonder how they got this the way it is, and let me worship that God in that way. And mm -hmm. that way, I can have the same prosperity that they can have. You continue to do what I tell you to. And then he goes on, because you see where this leads. They're um, um, worshiping their gods and doing things their way. You're going to end up putting your children through the fire. That's where it leads to. That is an abomination to God. Yeah, literal child sacrifice. He, he tells them, don't go down this path because this is where you're going to end up. That's exactly right. Um, and yeah, exactly. He's, he's saying you go in there and if you start looking to them instead of to me, start looking to their ways and their practices instead of to the law, where you put your mind, that's where you're going to go. So you need to stay focused on me and what I have revealed to you. Um, and an application for us today would be what? Clint. Don't be influenced by other denominations. Don't be influenced by other so-called church leaders. Right. I, I think more and more uh, there are brethren who are looking to see what denominations are doing and they're maybe not wholesale adopting them, but it's like they're looking to them as the model of how to attract and draw people. And that's, that's a dangerous thing. I'm not saying everything denominations do is wrong. But to use them as a standard, to be enamored with them and their popularity and the excitement around it, that's, a, that's an extremely dangerous road to go down. As Clint said, we've we got to be looking into the Word. What does the Word tell us to do? Is there different technologies we can use to, to reach people? You know, TV program, which, you know, 100 years ago, that just wasn't there. Sure. Sure, there's things like that. But there seems to be more of this appeal and a denominational approach as to how, to how to draw people in. You can see a lot of this in VBSs and where a lot of people are now dressing up as characters and they're putting on shows and plays for kids. It's, I, it, I don't know if anybody's seen any of that, but some of it is shocking as to how far down the road they've gone from having, you know, little things drawn on a piece of paper to illustrate to kids, to little figures in the class, to people dressing up, to actual, you know, acting out of the Bible story, which I grew up in institutional churches of Christ. They had plays and puppet shows and everything all the time. And this is, to me, that's, boom, we're there. We're exactly there. What, what I grew up in and what I left. Zach and then Mike, I think. I was going to extend Clint's point to Church of Christ. Well, what is that Church of Christ doing? How are they succeeding? There might be some good we can draw from that. How are they evangelizing? Is that being effective? How can we learn from that? But less, less does that apply to um, other things like what did that church do during the pandemic? How did they operate? We can't necessarily use other churches as a standard either. There might be tips and things, like I said, for evangelism, um, or a curriculum, a, a group went through, they went through the Gospels for a year, or something like that. Those things are 
could be beneficial, but we still have to be careful not to compare Church of Christ to Church of Christ to determine how we offer. Yeah, Paul said comparing ourselves among ourselves. That's never the standard. The standard, there, there are things we can look at that brethren are doing or in theory that anybody is doing, but you've got to filter it back through the word. What does this say? That's going to be the ultimate standard in determination, Mike. Right. And that's where all that leads to. Presbyterian Church USA fully supports abortion, has for like 40 years. And, and you know, that's when you, when you start to appeal to the masses, and there's no filter for that, just like what he's talking about here, there has to be a filter that you go through. Um, without that, you may end up you know, murdering your own children. Right. Right. Exactly right. Any other thoughts? All right, so we got like seven minutes left. <laughs> uh, we will not get through chapter 13. Let's read, though, verses 1 through 5 here, please. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5. Who will grab that? Elijah. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has taught rebellion against the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of slavery to make you leave the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. Okay. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. Okay, yeah. All right. Um, so this entire chapter is dedicated to not tolerating false teachers or false prophets among the people. And he breaks it down to different categories. One through five was that first category. But question four, I'd ask what three categories are listed in here? Did, does anybody have that? He kind of addresses three different groups or categories. Okay, there are the false prophets who are being the prophets, so we might say religious leaders. Number two is family and friends. And number three, he talks about cities, about here's this city that it's been reported that this paganism is coming out of, and you need to investigate and go in and find out if that indeed is the case. But three categories. Uh, Similarities between them is idolatry is being promoted. You need to reject and punish it. And the difference is what? Anybody have a difference in these things? Difference is there's public things. The false prophets out there kind of publicly. And then with the family and friends, they're kind of privately coming to you and saying, Hey, you want to worship Moloch with me? You, you want to go worship Baal? Let's, let's go out here in the field or behind the barn or whatever it is. Uh, that type of thing. And it's national versus per, and personal responsibility depending on the situation as it unfolds there. But the upshot in verses 1 through 5 is don't tolerate religious leaders promoting error. And he, he addresses it from a standpoint of you know, they, they, they come in and they even give you a sign and a wonder, but they tell you, let's go after other gods. Don't listen to them. You need to punish them. Um, or whether, and so why is the Lord allowing that? Verse 3. Test the people. Test the people. To determine what? Do you love me or not? You know, people have this question. Well, 
why did God, why does he allow temptation? This is the answer right here. Testing. Testing. If, if there wasn't temptation, there would not be love. If you don't have a choice, there is no love. You have to have a choice in order to express love, to apply love. Because if you don't have a choice, what is it? Bang. What? Bang. Bang. Your religion would be bang. Well, it, it, it would be vain, but if you don't have a choice, if you're made to do something, in other words, if, if the only thing you can do is right, what is it? I can't hear. I, I think I hear whispering, but maybe there's voices in my head. It, it's either something you call like a robot or coercion or slavery God gave us a choice to obey or not to obey. And that's because he wants us to choose to love him, which means we have to choose to serve him, which means we have to choose to reject Satan and the paganism, whatever that error is that's being presented to us. That's why he allows it. You know, some people look at God as being bad for allowing temptation. And he's not bad. What he's doing is he's, he's saying, I want a relationship that you choose to have with me. Not that I make you have, but you choose to have with me. Mike. Well, that's a great question, Joe, also. Can man serve God without all of the frills of life? Mm -hmm. Choose to serve God. Mm -hmm. And if you don't choose to serve God, Right. And, but those, as you pointed out, those things have to be laid out in order to see if that man is going to serve. Right. There, yeah, if there's, there's no testing, you really don't know your strength. You don't know for sure whether or not. I mean, that's one of the great things about Genesis 22, where Abraham is tested in the offering of Isaac. You know, the Lord says, now I know. But also, Abraham knew the extent, the point to which he was willing to go in serving God. And so when we're tested, it helps build our confidence as we make the right choice, as we do the right thing. Any other thoughts there? All right, Lord willing, we'll pick up next week. Deuteronomy 13, verse 6. We'll get through the rest of that chapter.